It's time to jump into week two. Uh, last week, Pastor Marlo started with week one. You can go back on the website and, and uh, find the podcast to be able to listen to last week's message. This week, we're going to be focusing on the historical books. Now, for those of you who are new or haven't been around for a while, this series through the Bible in seven weeks will take a 30,000-foot flyover of all 66 books of the Bible. So, if you do not yet own your own Bible, you are in luck, because today is the day for you. At the end of this morning, the table in the back where you're going to see those booklets that were just handed out, there are also some really nice Bibles that we want to invest into your Bible reading. Uh, this is in a, in a modern version, so it's really easy to read. It's even, I'm not going to say it's leather bound, because that's kind of a lie. It's bonded leather. It's like fake leather, but it's really nice. Uh, no, we, but they really are really great Bibles because we don't want to invest into something that you read for a while. We want to give you a lifetime Bible to be able to invest into. Those are free for you. All we ask is just that you write your name down. We just want to know where the Bibles are going because as pastors, we want to be praying for you as you jump into reading the Bible. So make sure when you leave this morning, go to the back table. You'll see Deb there. She'll be smiling at you. Be excited to give you one of these Bibles, Okay. All right, now if you have your Bible with you already this morning, have it with you as we jump through this. Last week, again, was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This morning, we are going to study the section of 12 books called the historical books. Now, a question for you as we start this morning. How many of you, when you think of the Bible, think of the Bible as being a source of history? Okay, half of you? Let's hope that changes by the end of our morning, okay? It is a, a source and a reliable source of history. In fact, the Bible actually has been correct about a lot of historical things that we've only found out through archaeological discoveries that have confirmed things that were in the Bible. Now, while history is the study of things past, the lessons of truths of history are not meant to be kept in the past. History is meant to be a teacher to the present. Historical narratives offer us stories that can warn us of pitfalls and potential destruction and inspire us towards humility, courage, wisdom, character development, godliness, and most importantly, hope. Think of it this way. Moments in recent history and the lessons that have been learned as we reflect back to them. Let's take, for example, landing on the moon which shows us the potential of human achievement and exploration. Very inspiring. Or on the opposite end of the spectrum, think of the concentration camps of Nazi Germany, like Auschwitz. The lesson of how evil ideology can capture the soul and allow evil to take over. The warning to never give up on the truth that we discovered in Genesis, that all of mankind is made in the image of God and has inherent worth and value. Think of modern day people even, like the life of Billy Graham. He passed away this past year in the documentary that came out about his life and the thousands upon thousands of lives that were changed through his obedience to the call of God. Finally, think of students I want to involve you. Even what you are doing today will become someone else's history. These are amazing stories being written by lives that we will speak to in the future and also some shameless, shameless atrocities that will be spoken of in future generations. The key to our interactions to history is to pay attention, to note the lessons from the past, the truths that were learned and to be reminded of, of the things we do not want to repeat so that we can make more expedient and wise decisions in the present. God considers history to be such an important and valuable teacher that he dedicated an entire portion of the Bible to it. The first of the history books starts with Joshua and goes all the way through to the book called Esther. So just consider us being the bell that's now rung and class is now in session. We're going to be going through a lot, so let's dive in. Now before we go through each individual book, here's an overview of the history books. The book of Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses and the people of Israel getting ready to enter the promised land. The history books cover the history of the people of Israel in the land, and there is a lot of history. It begins with Joshua leading the people of Israel into the land and taking possession. 
As the people begin to settle, they appoint leaders known as judges, which then lead to kings, beginning with Saul, and then David, and then Solomon. And then there is a split, a civil war, if you will, between the north and the south part of Israel. The people of Israel were made up of 12 tribes, based on the 12 sons of Jacob and their descendants. After the split, the north, which was known as Israel, was made up of 10 of the original 12 tribes. And the south, which became known as Judah, was made up of the other two tribes. And when the split happened, that's when things really start to go downhill. Corrupt leadership, people drifting away from God, and continual cycles of apostasy and rebellion. Eventually, the north is defeated and captured by the Assyrians. And then, just over a hundred years later, the southern kingdom falls to the Babylonians. But it's during those years you have some of the most famous stories in the Bible. You have Joshua blowing the horns around the city of Jericho and the walls falling down. You have Samson and his long hair and legendary strength. I know you're seeing some similarities already. You have David taking on Goliath with a slingshot and Esther risking her life to save her people. You have heroes like King Josiah, a king who calls the people back to God, and villains whose names have become synonymous with evil like Jezebel, which I looked up and is not a very common baby name in case you're running. It's shocking. You have the building of the temple under Solomon and then the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians and then the rebellion of the temple under Ezra and Nehemiah. And while all this is going on, God unleashed the prophets onto the scene with names like Elijah and Elisha in the north and Isaiah and Micah in the south. These history books are just a really great, fascinating read. So let's walk through a bit of it, beginning with the book of Joshua. Now, if the book of Joshua has a theme, it's possessing the land that God had promised the people of Israel. And it's a very interesting dynamic to remember that this was God's land to give, but the people's land to possess, which is a dynamic that is very true for our lives as well. God has given us so much if we will only possess it, reach for it, seize it, and accept it. It's like the gift of salvation. It's already ready for you that God has given it, but it's your choice to possess it, to receive it. Moses had led the people out of bondage, and Joshua completed what Moses began. The nation was led out by, uh, led out by Moses is led into the promised land by Joshua, but it took some time. Though the land was distributed amongst the 12 tw tribes, they didn't take full possession of it. Or more accurately, they didn't finish conquering the people there in order to take full possession of it. That is until the time of King David. Now, there's a big question that gets raised in this portion of scripture. What about the people who were already in the land before the Israelites got there, the Canaanites? Some people wonder about the ethics of the Jewish people suddenly showing up and kicking them out. And what about this God who says, I've got your promised land, and it's almost like he's ignoring the fact that people are already living there, and not even considering that it's their land already. Well, that's not actually really the full story. First, let's state the obvious. The land didn't really belong to the Canaanites, and it also didn't really belong to the Israelites. In fact, it didn't belong to anybody. It was God's land to give to whoever he wanted. He made it, and he could do whatever he wanted to do with it. If he wanted to give it to the Israelites, that was his right. But there was something else going on here as well. This wasn't just God giving something to the Israelites. It was also God's planned punishment of the people of Canaan for their ways. This punishment was very long in the making and in the coming. God was displacing them from the land to give it to the people of Israel, but that displacement came because of their ferocious, habitual, unrepentant evil. And I mean evil. They had given themselves over to the most fierce type of wickedness. The Canaanites were marked by the, most, by the worst possible aspects of slavery. I'm not saying that there's positive aspects of slavery, but take slavery to the darkest place that you can, and that's where you find them. 
the worship of false gods, religious prostitution, and sexual cults. In fact, scholars have called the Canaanite cult religion the most sexually depraved of any in the ancient world, and perhaps the most depraved in all of ancient history. They had given themselves over to every kind of sexual depravity, including incest and even bestiality. At their worst, their orgiastic worship of idols even included human sacrifice, both of children and adults. There is even imagery of their cult sexual practices of bathing themselves in the blood of the adults and children whom they had slaughtered. The Bible says that God had been tolerating this for more than 400 years. Their wickedness kept increasing and increasing, and God continued to endure it. 400 years of restraint and patience, hoping that they would turn. Why? Because if you have not yet learned this, hear this now. No matter what you've heard, judgment is always God's last resort. But the wickedness had reached a point where Scripture talks about how God couldn't stomach it anymore, and he vomited them out of his mouth. The Israelites taking the land was that divine, righteous judgment. This brings us to the book of Judges. So this is named Judges because of the judges selected from the people to serve as overseers and rulers. Judges covers the time from the death of Joshua to when Saul was installed as king. Now, this is a very interesting time in Israel's history. They had spent a long time in slavery in Egypt, then went through 40 years of living in tents and wandering around as nomads in the desert. Now they were in a new land and were settlers for the first time in their lives. No longer nomads, but citizens. And it wasn't a very smooth transition. They had to adjust to a national life. And the transition did not go very well. Think of the equivalent. I remember reading a story a couple of years ago about a woman who had grown up in the jungle being raised by wolves. It was a true story. You can imagine when she finally came into human contact and moved into a city in South America, that was a gigantic adjustment. These nomads, these people who were constantly on the travel, suddenly had a nation of their own, and with that came a lot of unforeseen challenges to them. Some have called Judges the account of the dark ages of Israel. And it is true that in this part of their history, we see the constant ritual abandoning of God. The heart of what went wrong during this period can be found in a sentence that you read in the book of Judges over and over again. It's just one line that the author keeps repeating as you read about what's going on. And here it is straight from the book of Judges. In those days, everyone did as he saw fit. It was an attitude. I'm not going to answer to the God in heaven. I'm not going to care about other people. I'm going to do what I want to do and what I see as fit. I am my own morality. I am my own truth. I am my own everything. Does this not sound familiar? And when you read Judges, you see that one line over and over again. So God, attempting to get them to turn around, would allow them to fall into the hands of other nations. Then, while under the oppression and persecution, they would come to their senses and cry out to God for deliverance. Then God would raise up a judge who would do just that. Judges with names like Gideon and Samson and Deborah. And for those of you who think God only used men in the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, check out the story of Deborah in Judges 4. Then, once rescued, the Israelites would go right back to their old ways. It's a sad, sick, ongoing cycle throughout the book. In fact, in the book of Judges, you can count seven of these cycles. Seven times they committed apostasy and, and abandoned God. Seven times they fell into the hands of other nations. And seven times God then delivered them when they came to their senses. So why did this keep happening? Why was it so hard for them to settle in the land and keep their heads on straight? It's actually, I think, something that we all struggle with. They just struggled more famously than most. See, instead of influencing the culture around them, they let the culture around them influence them. They began to worship the false idols of the Canaanites. They began to accept the morals, the laws, their values, their standards. 
They were supposed to possess the land and lay claim to it, but they allowed the land and its people to possess and lay claim on them. This is key to why God has so much history in the Bible. It's because the history is there to teach us what to do and what not to do. Do you lay claim to the promises of God in your life? Or do the things of this world, money, prestige, comfort, power, lay claim on you? It's against this backdrop we then jump into the events of the book of Ruth. We don't know who wrote the book of Ruth. Most scholars tend to think it was Samuel. But it's a wonderful story of the woman who would prove to be the great-grandmother of King David. It's considered one of the great stories in the Bible of love and faithfulness and commitment and courage. And it's also a mirror of God's redeeming love for the world. And how through the Jews, the entire world, including the Gentiles, would be adopted in. Ladies, no cheesy romance novel or Hallmark movie is needed. Ruth provides one of the great love stories in the Bible between Ruth and a man named Boaz. Now let's move on to 1st and 2nd Samuel, which is actually one book in the original Hebrew text, just as 1st and 2nd Kings is actually just one book and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. The reason we refer to them as 1st and 2nd is because when the Bible was translated into Greek, they were put on standard scrolls. And these books were too long to fit onto the scrolls because the Greek language took up more space to write than the Hebrew language. So they simply put them on two. And they came to be known as the first scroll of Samuel and the second scroll of Samuel. And it just kind of stuck. But you really should read these as one single book. Now, with the book of Samuel, we begin the royal history of the people of Israel. The move from judges to kings, such as Saul, David, and Solomon. Collectively, they cover about a 500-year period around 1050 to 586 BC. Samuel is a wonderful book. It carries the name of its author, Samuel, who was a remarkable man and was a true hinge in history. Now, if you study much history, you know that one key to study is to go through and look for what are called hinge moments or hinge people and events. And if you want a classic example of finding in one person a real hinge in all of human history, Samuel would be it. Samuel was the last of the judges He was the first of the prophets, and he was the one that God used to institute the monarchy of the kings of Israel. He really was a linchpin for all of this. His record in the Bible is without blemish. It is hard to find a single mark against him. What we call 1 Samuel can be divided according to the names of its three primary characters. Chapters 1 to 7 deal with Samuel himself. Chapters 8 to 15 deal with Saul the first king, and chapters 16 to 31 deal with King David. And it's all written in the style of a biography, which makes it an easy read, and it gives us some of our favorite stories. Samuel is a boy, and David and Goliath, and the friendship of David and Jonathan. Now, I mentioned that Samuel was the first prophet. This really does mark a new era in how God dealt with the people of Israel. From this point forward, God would call out prophets prophets through whom he would speak his word and communicate with people. Another key development in the book is how God had Samuel start the monarchy. Now, God never wanted Israel to have a king except for himself. Great leaders, yes, but leaders who would receive their orders and directions directly from him. And in a perfect world, God didn't want there to be kings and didn't think there needed to be kings. But Israel wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted a king like everyone else had a king. And God eventually gave them one because they said they had to live, or, but said they had to live with the consequences of it. Now, as we enter into an election period, if you're a person that is getting tired of seeing road signs on the side of the road already, just know this. That wasn't God's plan. Maybe you see a road sign like this. I like this one. But God's plan wasn't for those leaders. But yet that was something that we asked for. Now, I want you to know this. From the the front of Eagle Mont, you will never hear myself or one of the other pastors ever tell you who to vote for. That's something we ask you to pray for. And I just want to take this moment to encourage you to do that in the weeks to come. I am going to put a plug because I did see this next poster. And given his kind of resume, I would endorse him. He looked good. Can you give the next one? 
For those of you who get that joke, you're going to have that song running through your head the rest of the morning. But government was never actually God's plan. Kingdoms, the, the kingship was never actually the plan of God. He wanted to be the king solely. But because the people begged, he gave it. Now, the first king that Israel got was Saul, and he was not a good king. He could have been, but he gave in to pride. And he was almost insanely jealous over David, who would end up being the next king. And he tried to kill him five different times. Just so you know, usually if you try to kill someone five times, it's probably a mark that you don't like them. But much of what Saul did to get rid of David actually made David the great king he would become. He learned to fight. He learned to lead. He became independent, and most of all, he learned to trust God. And that's where 2 Samuel kicks in. It's the failure of Saul and the wild success of David. And the Bible gives David one of the highest accolades of all of Scripture. It says this, that David was a man after God's own heart. It doesn't say that he was perfect. In fact, David was far from it. If you know anything about David, he he had some epic failures. In fact, in your readings from this week, we see a colossal moral failure on David's part in 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 5. So you're going to be reading that if you haven't already. As David has an affair with another man's wife, then he has that man killed at war to cover it up. And one of his advisors eventually has to challenge him over it. David was no saint. But here's the key to David and why he was known as a man after God's own heart. When he sinned, he confessed it. He became repentant. And in fact, that's actually what matters most. He had a tender heart toward God in relation to his sin. It was because his heart was fully God's. He looked to God. He trusted God. And he hungered for God. And that's what separated him from Saul. Both were kings and both served 40 years. But Saul was an unrepentant sinner. David was a repentant sinner. And that's why what God cares about and what separates people God can use and those he can't. So a question for you this morning, are you a repentant sinner? Are you a person who makes mistakes but confesses and turns to God? Or are you justified in your own self-righteousness? Do you just explain your way out of it? David really is a pivotal character. He is the halfway point between Abraham and Jesus in terms of God's redemptive plan. Abraham began the chosen people. David formed them into a nation, and Jesus would come from the house and the line of David to be their savior. So let's move on to Kings and Chronicles. And I don't want to lump them together because they cover much of, or I want to lump them together because they cover much of the same period, just from different standpoints and emphases. Kings is really just a continuation of Samuel. As the name suggests, it's a record of the events of the reign of Solomon, David's son, and the lines of kings that followed him, both in the north and the south. Before it was over, the north would have 19 different kings, and the south would have 20 different kings. It covers about a 400-year period of history. Through Solomon, we see the growth of the kingdom and later its decay. We see the kingdom divided, and then eventually, both the north, which is Israel, and the south, which is Judah, led into captivity. Kings opens with David as king of Israel, but ends with the king of Babylon conquering it. It opens with the building of the temple, and it ends with the destruction of the temple. And it is during this time that you have the great prophets, such as Elijah. You get to read about him. If you haven't already this past week in 1 Kings, who do amazing things for God. It's kind of a downward spiral through the book, and it's kind of depressing at times to read, but yet it's intriguing. It has much to teach us. But make no mistake, it really starts off great. Solomon did did not honor God through his entire life, but he started off really strong. In 1 Kings, we see God tell Solomon he will... Give him anything he asks for. Again, this is another one of your readings this week. Anything he would ask for. Anything he could imagine. Given that invitation, what would you ask for? What would be your request if God said anything? If you you need a modern day illustration, you are Aladdin. You get your wish. Anything you want, what would you ask for? 
Now, as you, in your readings, you'll see this week, Solomon asked for wisdom, and he received it. He later built the temple. He built the nation into the premier power of that part of the world, so much so that even the queen of Sheba was speechless at its grandeur. But he fell into pride and eventually into idolatry. But that isn't actually what split the kingdom. Why did the ten tribes separate from the two that were in the south? Two words. Solomon's son. The guy was politically clueless and screwed things up about as bad as anyone possibly could. Here is what was going on. There was a lot of pent-up resentment among the people over high taxes and forced labor. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, gathered some counselors and leaders together and said, what should I do? And they said, listen, you want the people to love you. You want to have a long reign. Do you want to make the transition seamless between you and your father? Just back off the taxes a little bit. Back off on the forced labor a little. The people will love you for it. But Rehoboam didn't listen to them. He listened to his own friends who just said what he wanted to hear. Essentially, they don't like taxes. They don't like forced labor. Let's up the taxes. Let's make them work even harder. As you can imagine, it didn't go over very well. The ten tribes of the north said, we are done with you. And civil war broke out and they separated off. And that was the end of the unified people of Israel. Rehoboam's power base, including the capital city of Jerusalem, was in the south. They had already been centuries of tension between the south and the north that was tribal in nature. So when this happened, the north just took their toys and went home and left for the south to fend for itself. So if you look on the screen, you can see how this divided up about the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. The north became known as Israel, and the south again, which included the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, became known as Judah. In the end, the Assyrians captured and took the ten tribes who never returned to the promised land. The south was also captured, but by the Babylonians, who were eventually defeated by the Persians, who did allow the Jews to return and reestablish themselves, but we will get there. So the Jewish people today are essentially the descendants of only the two tribes, which is why they became commonly known as Jews, taken from the name of the tribe of Judah. And much of what the rest of the Old Testament records circulates, circulates around these times. But I want to go back to something that I've mentioned a couple times this morning, because it looms large throughout the entire narrative here, throughout all 12 books. And it's so important to understand because of its relevance to what Jesus did. And it's this thing called the temple. A lot of people are confused about what it was, what it did, and what it meant. So let's just spend a couple seconds on the temple. Now in the days of Moses, God instructed that a tabernacle be built as the place of worship. This tabernacle looked like the slide in front of you. The heart of the tabernacle was the holy place. And then inside of that, the most holy place. The holy of holies, which had the Ark of the Covenant. Now, for those of you who watched Indiana Jones, yes, the Ark of the Covenant is a real thing. Lasers funneling out of people's eyes, not so much. But the Ark of the Covenant was real and historical. And it was kept in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And this holy, most holy place, the Holy of Holies, was separated from the second most holy place, the holy place, by a curtain. The holy place represented God's royal guest chamber, where God's people symbolically came before God through the bread, the incense, and the light from the lampstand that was placed there. The most holy place represented God's throne room. It was the innermost sanctuary, and it was kept separate through a curtain. Because during that time, people didn't have direct access to the presence of God. Only the priests were allowed into the holy place, and only the high priest entered the most holy place. And that was only once a year. So holy was this place that they would tie a rope on the leg of the high priest who entered it so that if he died while inside, potentially because he was not holy enough to do the sacrifice that he was supposed to be doing, he could be dragged out without anyone else entering it. Wouldn't that be a job you would love to put a resume in for? But even then, he could only enter with a blood sacrifice which was offered for himself and for the sins of the people once a year. 
Now, the portable tabernacle eventually received a permanent home in the temple that we've been speaking about that was built by Solomon. And here's what it looked like. If you want to put the next slide up. Again, as you look, with the holy place separated from the most holy place by the temple veil or curtain. This temple, which was the holy site to Jews, was destroyed in 586 B.C. And it was at that time that the Ark of the Covenant was lost until Indiana Jones found it. Not true. Then a man named Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple, and a man named Nehemiah restored the walls. But it wasn't much more than a box. Then the temple was rebuilt, or really expanded upon its past glory in 20 BC by King Herod. Now, here's what that temple looked like. It was much more elaborate and huge, but with the same interior design. This was the temple that Jesus encountered, and it was destroyed in 70 AD. Again, you see the holy place and the most holy place separated by a curtain. We only have one wall of this that still survives. And here's a picture of it. You may have heard about it on the news. It's called the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. This is, uh, you may have seen people of people praying and inserting written prayers into the cracks. It is the only surviving remnant of the temple and it is Judaism's most holy site. Now, I say all that to say this. This is what's so cool about knowing all that. Here's what the Bible said happened when Jesus officially gave up his life and died on the cross for you and for me. In Luke 23, 45, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. At the moment Jesus died, the curtain between the holy place and the holy of holies, the most holy place, was torn in two. Now this veil would have been about, it's not just a regular curtain you would hang out in your house. It was about four inches thick. 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. And the one that was actually in the temple that Herod built, he had to make it a little larger, so it was actually 60 by 30 by 30. And they say that you could tie horses to the end of it and have them try and run in opposite directions and you wouldn't be able to rip that curtain. At the moment Jesus gave up his life, that curtain miraculously split in two. Why? Why? Because as the book of Hebrews explains, Jesus at that moment became our high priest. He entered into the most holy place on our behalf only with his own blood. And it was at that point then that the curtain came down once and for all. The curtain that separated the actual presence of God from his people. From that point forward, no priest would be needed to voice prayers on our behalf or to serve as mediators between our lives and God's. No longer would we need to go to a temple and sacrifice idols. The ultimate sacrifice had been made. And everything that began with Moses and the sacrificial system had reached its fulfillment and completion in Jesus. And now we're able to go directly into the presence of God through Jesus Christ. Directly to the throne in prayer. We can receive forgiveness and grace and relationship. When Jesus died on the cross, it took away all the barriers between us and God. And here's how the writer of the New Testament book of Hebrews puts it. So friends, we can now, without hesitation, walk right up to God, into the holy place. Jesus has cleared the way by the blood of his sacrifice, acting as our priest before God. The curtain into God's presence is his body. So let's do it. Wow. So from here, we move forward to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which like 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Chronicles and 1 and 2 Kings were originally one book. Together, they give us the record of the return of the Jews from exile in Babylon back to the Promised Land. Zerubbabel, had already done a restoration of the temple. But Ezra and Nehemiah led the return, as well as the rebuilding of the city and its walls. They were quite a team. Ezra was the spiritual leader, the priest, and he was a real renaissance man. He started what is known as the synagogue worship while the people were in exile when they didn't have the temple to go to. He formulated the Old Testament canon and probably wrote portions of Chronicles and perhaps the 119th Psalm. 
Now, Nehemiah was just as remarkable. He rose to great prominence in the, gov- in the government as the cupbearer to the king. And, and I know that job doesn't sound very glamorous and actually sounds quite menial, but believe me, it definitely was not. A cupbearer was one of the highest positions that you could have. It was his job to give the king whatever he drank, meaning he was the one man who was tr- most trusted not to poison the king. So essentially, he was the equivalent of the chief of staff. He was the organizer, the one with political and economic connections. And together, they did a great work. And those books tell their story. Finally, lastly this morning, that brings us to the book of Esther. The end of what are called the historical books. Which, while it follows Ezra and Nehemiah in the Bible's table of contents, it's actually chronological, it's easy to say, isn't it? chronologically, took place before then. In fact, its place in history is interesting. Now, has anybody seen the movie 300? Sheepishly, one guy says yes and everybody else. I'll ask again, has anybody seen the movie 300? Any guys? Okay, all right. Now, there's a tie in here. If you've seen the movie 300, the whole thing is about Xerxes, who attacks 300 Spartans... And they hold him off. Now that Xerxes from the movie 300 is the same Xerxes that you see in the book of Esther. So men, if you want to watch 300, you can just tell your wife you're doing some historical study on the book of Esther. Now Esther is the story of a beautiful Jewish woman who is selected to be the queen for the, uh, for the Persian king Xerxes. She then uses her position to save the Jewish people from genocide which we see later that same Jewish people would eventually take the land that was promised to them. And eventually, through Jesus, we see the ultimate promise that was made to the Israelites that salvation, life, and grace would be received through all the world through Abraham's offspring, through Jesus. So there, you have the history books. This brings us to the end of our class this morning. Now, a couple things, again, I want to encourage you with before we close in prayer. If you haven't yet, grab one of the guides in the back and participate in the readings this week. If you're able to join a small group, please do. I know there's many of you who are. But if you haven't been around for the last couple weeks, haven't been able to do that, or you just felt shy about doing it, there's still room for you and we want you there. If you're not able to do that because of whatever reason, still grab the study guides. Participate in this with us as we go through this entire journey of the Bible. Those are available in the back as well as a Bible that we have for you. Please take it and most importantly, use it because you're going to find so much life through it. I'm going to ask if you'll stand with me. And if you would this morning, I'm going to ask, as you, if you've been here at Eaglemont for any length of time, you've probably noticed that pretty much every Sunday we give an invitation for someone who does not yet know Jesus to come to know Jesus. And there's a reason why we do that. It's because there's nothing greater you can do with your life. There's nothing more important. And we don't want to ever miss the opportunity for someone to make that decision. So church, as we pray this morning, I'm going to ask everybody just to close your eyes. And if you are already a follower of Jesus, I just want you to pray for those who maybe haven't been able to make that decision and they don't know Jesus yet themselves. We want to give that opportunity. So we were talking about that division that was in the temple that God split that veil in half, that the presence of God would no longer be kept from his people. But just like the Israelites who had land that was given to them, they had to choose to possess it. You have to choose to take that gift that God has for you, which is that for God so loved the world, he so loved you, he gave his only son, that who would ever believe in him, invite them into their life, he would give eternal life. He would forgive their sins. That's an opportunity today. If you've never been able to make that decision, if you want to know for sure, yes, I want that God, that Jesus to be in me, that life. I want to be free from the things that have trapped me in my life. I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand and I'll pray for you as I close in prayer today about you receiving that gift. I'm going to just give 10 seconds. If there's anybody here today, if you want to just look my way, raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. Yes. Thank you in the back. Five more seconds. Anyone else want to join? Way to go. Way to go. Church, will you join me in prayer? 
that's you who raised your hand today or others who maybe just right now even, you just, I don't want to miss it. I just want you to pray these words. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you that you wanted to be with me. Speak against those lies that tell me you don't. I've got a lot of stuff in my life. And I'm having a hard time putting it together. I know I've made mistakes. So I ask, would you forgive me? Jesus, would you clean my heart and come live in me? Give me the life that you want for me. Help me to live for you. To not make the mistakes of those who've gone before. But help my life be about what you want. Thank you. The Bible says your life has changed forever. That confession. This morning, Lord, I just pray for us as a church. May we not simply be a footnote in history of those who have just repeated the cycles of the past, but may we learn from those who have gone before, and may we change, may we make decisions differently. May we not be like those in Judges who simply did what everyone saw fit. But Lord, I pray as we dive into your word where we see that it's not there to limit us, but rather your word is to give life and show us, Lord, what is most for us. Help us to walk into that. And I just pray this week as we go in our groups, as we discuss even online, as we have conversations, as we are with people at work and at school and at home, God, may we have life-giving, true conversations. May you change us from the inside out and may your word come to life in us and through us. I pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.